Welcome back everybody. In this video, I'm going to show you something that you've probably never seen before. I'm going to explain the exact reason behind each piece's point value. We know the point values of all the chess pieces. We know that, but do you know the exact reason why each piece has its point value? That's what I'm going to show you today. So let's jump into it. The question that drives this entire explanation is what is the maximum number of squares that my piece can control in my opponent's territory? If we can answer that question for each piece, we're going to figure out how much each piece is worth. That's going to explain it all. So first and foremost, when we're talking about our territory, we're talking about the 32 squares on our side of the board. So with the white pieces, we're talking about these 32 squares I've just highlighted. For the black pieces, we're talking about the other 32 squares on the other side of the board. So for example, let's start with the pawn here. The pawn is our baseline. It's only worth one point. So let's figure this out first and foremost. The pawn, so long as it's not on the A file or the H file, is going to control two squares in our opponent's territory. The pawn's on D5, it's gonna control C6 and E6. This is pretty simple. You can place it anywhere within this little box here and it's going to control two squares specifically. So remember that. Our pawn, it's worth one point and it controls two squares. Now let's move to the knight. We know that the knight is worth three points, but we also know that at its best, it can control up to eight squares. So circling back to the original question, we want to know the maximum number of squares the knight controls in the opponent's territory. So right now we've got the knight on d5, which means in the opponent's territory, it's only controlling four squares, the squares that I've just highlighted. So unfortunately, the four squares behind the knight aren't controlling anything in the opponent's territory. So that means we can't place the knight anywhere on the fifth rank. Similarly, we can't place it anywhere on the eighth rank because the squares in front of the knight are not on the board. They don't exist. <laughs> so we know we can't place it there either. We also know that we don't really want to place it on the rim. This knight is only going to be controlling a couple squares. So we'll quickly realize that eventually somewhere in the middle is actually where the knight is going to be controlling the most squares. So these eight squares specifically that I've highlighted are spaces where the knight controls six squares. So this knight here is controlling six squares. If we were to move the knight over here, this knight would also control six specific squares. Thinking back to the pawn, our baseline, we know that it was worth one point and it controls two squares. Now looking at the knight, we see that at its best in the opponent's territory, it controls six squares. Therefore, it's worth three points. Now let's move to the bishop. We know that the bishop is worth three points, but we've also heard that it's generally a little bit better than the knight is. Bobby Fisher had said it was worth 3.25 points. So we know it's somewhere around three, but probably a little bit over. So now let's try to figure out where we can place it optimally to control the most number of squares in our opponent's territory. So if we have it here on the rim, we're only gonna be controlling a couple squares, obviously the same on this side as well, if we had it over here. And let's see if we have it here on the back rank, then we'll be controlling six squares. That's pretty good. We can also put it in the center. Again, this is still six, but we're going to find that the best place to put it is actually going to be here on D4. So you'll see that here it actually controls an extra square. If we keep it back in our own territory, it's actually going to control one more square. We see that it controls seven squares. And of course, it would be the same if this were a light squared bishop, again, controlling seven squares. So this is how we come up with the idea that it's worth a little bit more than the knight, right? The knight controlled six squares, therefore it was worth three points compared to the pawn. This controls seven squares, therefore that would suggest that it's worth 3.5. That's probably a little bit high, but you can see how it controls one extra square in the opponent's territory. Therefore, it should be worth a little bit more than the knight is. Now let's move to the rook. If the formula holds based on the point value of the pawn, then this rook should be controlling 10 squares. So let's find a home for it. Let's say we put it on b5, then it's gonna be controlling all of these seven squares on the fifth rank, and also these three squares in front of it. If we were to put it on, let's say e8, again, it's controlling seven squares to its side and also three squares behind it. So you'll quickly realize that the rook can actually go anywhere on these 32 squares and it will always control 10 squares in the opponent's territory, always gonna be seven to the side and always gonna be three to the front or back of the rook. So the rook controls 10 squares, therefore it is worth five points. Now let's move to the queen. Our final piece here is the queen. We know that she is worth nine points. So 
let's place her on the other side of the board and figure out where she can exert the most pressure, control the most number of squares. So let's start with b5. From here, the queen controls seven on the side, three in front, and additionally four on the diagonals. Let's try, let's say h7, three in front and behind. We've got, again, seven on the sides, and this time three on the diagonal, so that's 13. So you'll see it's always controlling all 10 squares that the rook controls, and additionally, whatever it controls on the diagonals. So if you look at all the squares, you'll see that these squares that I'm highlighting right now, these squares are the ones where the queen controls 16 squares in the opponent's territory. So let's start to look at some of them. So we know it's controlling 10 for the rook's power, but it's also controlling six for the bishop. So let's just look at the diagonals. If it were on c7, again, it would be controlling six squares here. And let's look at one more. If we look at e7, again, it's controlling six on the diagonals. So in those squares, it's controlling 16 total squares in the opponent's territory. Doesn't that suggest that it should only be worth eight points? That kind of makes sense too, right? The rook is worth five. The bishop is just a little over three. The queen controls all the squares that both of those pieces do. Shouldn't it just be worth eight points? The reason that the queen is going to be just a little bit better considered nine points is that if this were just a bishop, it would only be controlling the dark squares. But the queen has the ability to move over to the light squares, right? So it's theoretically changing from being a dark squared bishop to a light squared bishop. And that mobility of the queen is extremely valuable. And that is what gives it that extra point of value. That's why it's not only worth eight points, it's actually worth a ninth point because it has this ability to move around the board and change the different squares it controls, change the different color complexes. If you enjoyed this video or if you feel like you learned something, then please give it a thumbs up and also consider subscribing. This was a concept that for the vast majority of my chess career, I had never even heard of. And I think it was maybe like a year or two back, I saw a Yasser Sirawan lecture where he explained this exact idea. And it was fantastic because I always knew the point value of each piece. I knew that the balance between the points always felt about right, but I never knew the reason why each piece was its specific point value. So it was such a cool concept and I wanted to make a video to share it with a lot of other people who probably hadn't heard of it or even considered it either. Now, in my professional opinion, I would recommend clicking on another video. There's gonna be another one that pops up. I would say just click on that. Let's just see where it takes you.